Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're hearing the voice of Jen Hughes at the National Endowment for the Arts, and I wanted to welcome you to this um, webinar today on the design and creative placemaking opportunities for historically black colleges and universities. We're going to share with you information today about our funding opportunities related to design and creative placemaking. And just wanted to let you know that we are offering this webinar as part of the White House Initiative on Historically Black Colleges and Universities. Please note, throughout the presentation, you should feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A box. Feel free to send those along as questions pop up, and we will move through our presentation, then begin to address all of the questions that you share. So before I dive more deeply into the opportunities, I thought it was worthwhile to just share some history that we have in working with the HBCU design community. Between 2009 and 2011, we worked with seven university architecture programs. You can see the logos of those institutions shown here and the SUNY Buffalo Center for Inclusive Design and Environmental Access in the School of Architecture and Planning, all with the intention to promote the development of universal design curriculum and service projects within the schools. The outcomes from the project were good. If any of you of any on the phone were involved in this program, we'd love to debrief about the impacts that you were able to see through your community. So please feel free to reach out to us after this webinar, as we'd love to reconnect on this past initiative. So you may be wondering, what exactly is the National Endowment for the Arts? We are an independent federal agency founded in 1965. Design has been a discipline within the agency since we were founded. And this photo here, you can actually see President Johnson signing in our founding legislation to establish the National Endowment for the Arts. We are the only arts funder in America, public or private, that supports the arts in all 50 states and U.S. territories. Staying true to the national in our name, we are also the only funder to make an award in all 435 congressional districts every single year. A project partner with state and other federal agencies and departments including industries like agriculture, health, transportation, and economic development. We really value relationships with other sectors where arts and culture and design has that intersection. So the next question, which is quite logical, is what does the National Endowment for the Arts do? The short of it is we give people across America opportunities to learn, create, and celebrate the arts by awarding grants, conducting and funding arts research, managing national initiatives, and offering free resources like weekly podcasts. So we encourage you to spend some time on our website at arts.gov to get to know us a bit better so that we can be a resource for um, your university. So in my short time here today, I'll introduce you to three different funding opportunities and pass this along to my colleague Courtney to walk you through those various programs. And really, the hope of this is to get your creative juices flowing. Please note, each of these grant programs, Challenge America, Artworks, and Art Town, requires a one-to-one -one match, which means if you're asking us for a $10,000 grant, you'll need at least $20,000 in project costs and bring at least $10,000 to the table. However, you can meet the match a variety of ways, in-kind goods, donated time, staff time, cash, other grants or donations, donated space, earned revenue, are all eligible ways to meet the match requirement for the NEA. The key thing to note is that we cannot be matched with other federal funds. So let me introduce uh, my colleague, Courtney Spearman, design specialist on our team, to begin introducing you to the first program, Challenge America. Hi there, thanks, Jen. Um, so Challenge America is our um, is perceived as sort of our entry-level grant program. It's a little bit more constrained in terms of the specific activities that you can do. Um, it is explicitly designed to extend the reach of underserved communities, or extend to, to, extend to reach the underserved communities um, across the U.S. Um, for this category, underserved includes those whose opportunities to experience the arts are limited by geography, ethnicity, economics, or disability. Um, grants are limited to $10,000 in this program, 
And the specific activities that you can do with this program relate to guest artists. So if you're inviting someone to um, come and perform or speak, um, public art projects, or cultural tourism projects. Uh, the first opportunity, the only opportunity during the year for this uh, grant category is in April. And funding for that is available the following January. Uh, I'm going to highlight just briefly one project in the Challenge America category. This is an award uh, that we've made for several years to Alcorn State University in Lorman, Mississippi. Um, it's for, their, it's for um, a jazz festival that they have every year, and they bring in a notable guest artist um, for this program each year. Arturo Sandoval has been honored, Ron Carter, Branford Marsalis, Chick Corea. Um, and uh, I'm highlighting this not because you guys are necessarily focused on jazz, but because uh, it's an example of bringing a notable person from the field of jazz, in this case, in your case it might be from design or architecture in some other way, um, to come and speak or engage with your university. Um, so just an opportunity you guys might think about that uh, pretty simple, straightforward in terms of the specific kinds of projects that can be funded. The next category I'm going to talk about is artworks. This is what I call our bread and butter grant program. It's our primary grant category. Um, artworks grants range from $10,000 to $100,000, again with that required one-to-one -one match. Uh, for most categories uh, in artworks, there are two deadlines. Uh, one in February and one in July, with a roughly 10-month lead time between the time of application and when the funds are available. Um, that, so that February deadline means that uh, funds are available at the beginning of January the following year. Um, with July, the funds are available at the beginning of June the following year. We have an artworks opportunity in each of these disciplines that you see here on the screen. Uh, so a lot of different ways to come to us. Um, because this particular webinar is focused on design and creative placemaking, we're going to spend some more time on that. Um, but I highly recommend that you look at the specific guidelines for a discipline that may not be the ones we're going to dig into today and consult with a specialist uh, from that field uh, at the agency to uh, make sure you're in the right category when you apply. Um, really want to hammer home throughout this whole conversation today that we really are here to help you and we have staff to um, guide you through the process. And so we highly recommend that you engage with us as much as you can whenever you have questions. So diving into a couple of specific grants in the artworks category. This is an award we made in 2016 to the Southside Community Art Center. Um, they came to us for the development of a renovation master plan uh, for their building and site. Uh, this building was opened in 1940 as an art center, and it is, I believe, the only original art center from the WPA era um, in Chicago that remains open today and still used for the original purpose. Um, in the case of this project, it's a preservation grant. They were looking for a renovation master plan to do some design work related to accessibility and energy efficiency, as well as longer-term um, structural issues that they were dealing with in the building itself. Um, in this case, we cannot pay for the preservation work itself, but we can pay for the entire design planning process. So design all the way through construction drawings. Second project I'm going to talk about is an award we made to a nonprofit called the Building Community Workshop. Um, they're based in Dallas. They also have a Washington, D.C. office. And uh, they, in this case, were partnering with the University of Virginia on a studio project um, looking at the impacts of gentrification on neighborhoods in D.C. Um, specifically, when they came in, they didn't know exactly what the project focus was going to be. They knew what the studio focus was going to be. Um, they knew that they wanted to do this in partnership so students had an opportunity to engage um, with the community, um, but they weren't sure exactly uh, what the focus was going to be. Where they landed was a project working with Kenilworth Gardens, which is a historic garden um, of water lilies here in D.C. It's owned by the Park Service. And they did a, an in-depth study with Park Service and D.C. government and a friends group um, together, basically did a study of what Kenilworth needed to do to engage the local neighborhood better um, from a, a design point of view. Right now, the the facade of the gardens towards the neighborhood is a pretty um, 
unwelcoming environment. And so they really wanted to look at how to change that to make it more welcoming to the people in the community as well as uh, visitors to the site. Another project uh, came out of a university um, outside, well, the project is in Detroit. This is an award we made to the Lawrence Technological University, which is in Southfield, Missouri, uh, sorry, Michigan. Um, they have a Detroit studio, which has been in place for a long time, and a faculty member there who's been working with communities in Detroit for about 15 years. Um, the project specifically was to look at a consolidated master plan and designs for multi-purpose bike stations in underutilized public parks in Detroit's West End neighborhood. Um, basically what they were doing is working with community members living in and around these parks to help them identify what infrastructure elements related to bikes and gardens and uh, recycling, kind of what facilities could they help design to improve the use of these parks for the local community people. All right, next project I'm gonna talk about is another one that was awarded directly to the University of Virginia. Um, this one has a focus on design, manufacture, build process. So it's through the School of Architecture and it's a combination planning and architecture um, team that we're leading it from the university. Um, basically, they're partnering with um, local public housing families, particularly youth, um, and doing a combination of training, um, having university students who are taking a summer design build course working with the communities with, of course, oversight and engagement from the faculty to engage young people who live in these communities um, in a design thinking process and also teach them about manufacturing. So they were going to be making a, a public art piece, a site-specific art installation, um, but doing that in partnership with local manufacturing facility as well as the university. So it was a pretty in-depth community engagement process that they went through to um, come up with this particular project. And I think just one thing to add before we move into the next um, sort of realm of opportunities here at the agency is just to note that we just are showing you a very small snippet of the types of projects that fall under the category of design under our Artworks grant program. We're able to support projects that include architecture, landscape architecture, communications and graphic design, uh, fashion design. So we really encourage you to think quite comprehensively about the various programs that might be in existence at your college or university. And just know that these are just some ideas to, to help inspire and begin to show you what we're able to support in that, that project-based capacity. Great. Yes, thank you, Jen. Um, all right, now we're going to actually dive into the Our Town category, and Jen's going to talk about that a little bit more. Great. So the Our Town program um, is the National Endowment for the Arts Creative Placemaking Grant Program. And this is the largest funding opportunity at our agency with grants that range from 25,000 to 200,000. And we have a single deadline each year um, in August for funding that becomes available the following July. So I just wanted to briefly highlight how our town is unique and different than um, some of our other grant programs here at the agency. First and foremost, all our town projects require a partnership between a nonprofit entity and a local government entity. So um, your college or university could actually serve in that capacity as, as nonprofit in partnership with a local or tribal government. And the idea is that these projects receive an endorsement from the community's highest ranking elected official. In some places, that might be a county supervisor, others, it might be the mayor. And the creative placemaking category of our town really requires projects that are explicitly community-driven and asset-based, um, reflective of the unique community needs and desires and incorporating local resources into the proposed projects. And what we're really trying to fund are catalytic projects um, where sort of this, this creative placemaking work can help to inspire or ultimately infuse a broader planning or development effort. So you might be wondering, what is creative placemaking? Simply put, the definition of creative placemaking for the NEA is really looking at the role of art, culture, and design in influencing and helping to drive community revitalization. Um, the idea that arts and culture has a profound impact in the places we live is, is not new, but the terminology creative placemaking is a relatively new term. 
And what I think is really important to emphasize um, in the space of creative placemaking by the NEA's definition is that we're really trying to drive equitable outcomes um, that, that ultimately serve and strengthen the local community. Um, so we've seen some notable shifts in the last several years where folks are really driving economic impact um, as well as really interesting projects that strive to um, integrate arts, culture, and design to driving health and wellness, better transportation outcomes, better housing outcomes, education, and community aesthetics, and really being utilized as a strategy to strengthen a community's sense of identity. So when we talk about creative placemaking, we're not just talking about art for art's sake. And when we talk about artists, we're really recognizing that there are artists in the broadest sense of the word in every community. So just to give you a little bit of sense for what we fund in the Our Town Creative Placemaking Program, I'm just going to walk you through a couple quick projects. And this first project actually is, um, is one that is a great example for several reasons. This was an award that went to the National Trust for Historic Preservation in partnership with the city of New Iberia, Louisiana. And it was to support a theatrical event that focused on African-American experiences in the 19th and 20th centuries at Shadows on the Tesh, also known as the Shadows, in New Iberia, Louisiana. And at the time of application, they were proposing um, a jury selection playwright process that would develop a series of short plays and vignettes that tell the difficult history of slavery and race relations in New Iberia. And the new material was going to be sourced from historic documentation and community members, and ultimately performed at the Shadows, which is a former slaveholding sugar plantation built in 1834, as well as putting on programming that would take place in public spaces throughout the downtown. So this is a project that was really intended to strengthen the social cohesion of the community, bring a strong sense of um, community identity to the presence, and really utilize arts and culture as a mechanism for discussing some um, challenging issues and histories within the community. So what I think is notable, particularly about this project, when we received the application, they didn't quite yet know who the playwright would be. Ultimately, they selected Aoife Baeza um, to put forth uh, a, a play and poem that she would um, draft as a one-act dramatic work that was really focused on Bunk Johnson. And Bunk Johnson was an accomplished jazz trumpeter who performed in concert halls and on stage from California to New York um, with various jazz, le jazz legends, including Jelly Roll Morton, Cindy Beckett, and Louis Armstrong. And what was really incredible about this is he was actually a gardener that used to work at the Shadows. So it was a really beautiful um, outcome of this project. While they didn't know the details of who the playwright would be and what the work would be on specifically, that was really developed after the NEA grant award. And they utilized those fundings to um, commission the artist to pull together um, and draft the actual play and the ultimately fund and support the performance. So that gives you a little bit of an idea where you might not necessarily need to know the exact details of the artists or designers involved at the outset of a project, but you should put forth um, some thoughtful process in thinking about um, how an artist would ultimately be selected to work on a project. This next example, um, is actually taking place in Arlington County. And this is one of our earlier Our Town projects um, that, that funded uh, the county level government to support master planning design and public art for Knock Town Square. The landscape architect, public artist, and national design award winner, Walter Hood, was commissioned to lead a community engagement activities to inform a design for the square as well as an integration of work of temporary public art at the site. And the Knock neighborhood um, in Arlington County has a very wonderful um, African American history and legacy of really impressive residents that live throughout the community, but they've noticed a very dramatic decline in the African American population over the last two decades 
um, as sort of the the Washington D.C. metro area um, has really accelerated and changed. So this project is primarily about the revitalization of the square to build on recent planning efforts and focus on preserving the really important historic and demographic character of the community. And what's really great about this project, we were able to fund and support the landscape architecture fees as well as um, the community planning charrettes and efforts that were led by Walter Hood. And public art in the... As, as well as the public art that will ultimately be installed on the site. So thanks for adding that in, Courtney. And this project is just about to break ground, um, I think, in early 2019. The next project I'm going to highlight was actually stewarded by a university, um, Mississippi State University, their small town center, uh, partnered with Marks, Mississippi, so the, the town of, of Marks, Mississippi was the primary partner on this project, to highlight and interpret sites of the historic 1968 Poor People's Campaign where protesters from across the South boarded a wagon train pulled by mules that originated in Marks, Mississippi and ended in Washington, D.C. Mississippi State University's Carl Small Town Center partnered with the County Board of Supervisors, the City of Marks, to lead community workshops, which were ultimately intended to identify trail highlights throughout the city and propose historical exhibitions and experiences that recreate and <coughs> celebrate the mule train. So this type of um, community design process really blends a lot of different activities in one project. It was both to highlight the, the important Marks history as part of a broader regional tourism development strategy for the Delta region. And we were able to fund um, the collection of oral histories and oral stories that were shared to inform the exhibits, as well as the ultimate exhibit design and signage um, throughout uh, Marks, Mississippi. In Memphis, Tennessee, um, this project was led by an organization called Community Lift in partnership with the Memphis Shelby County, as well as the, the Soulsville Neighborhood Association. And they did a wonderful project that was really focused about um, installing artist residencies within the community and driving community-led design. The support was offered as training for emerging musicians, programming for artist residencies, and a community-led design process in Soulsville. Local residents, businesses, students, and institutions came together to really reimagine a vacant property as a creative community space. And ultimately, this space was turned into the Slim House Studio, which hosted training, apprenticeship programs, and residencies for emerging musicians, performers, and visual artists. And this new Slim House Studio really served as an anchor within the community and helped uh, to drive revitalization, as well as providing the local artists the opportunity and space to connect, to record music, and as well as perform. So again, those are just a few snippets of some of the projects that have been funded in the Our Town Creative Placemaking Grant Program. But we have many more examples on our website to share, and we're happy to do so. I think it's important at this stage to really shift a little bit more into the mechanics so you can begin to envision how your college or university really might fit into the various grant opportunities here. And I think the first thing to really emphasize is that applicant eligibility. Um, here listed on the screen, the types of organizations that the NEA can directly grant to include nonprofits, 501c3 organizations, colleges and universities, local arts agencies, official units of state or local government, school districts, as well as federally recognized tribal communities or tribes. All applicants have to have a three-year history of arts programming. Um, we recognize that the universities and colleges, um, most likely on this call, have a far longer, deeper history of putting on programming in the past, so clearly that won't be an issue. We talked a little bit about that required one-to-one -one non federal match minimum. Um, like I said earlier, we're really flexible in working with applicants to make sure we help identify sources of in-kind that might serve as that match. 
Um, applicants have to submit reports, final reports to the NEA to close out a grant award. And then this, this last um, element or bullet on this slide is that only one application to the Artworks and or Challenge America grant program per organization per year can be received by the agency. So that really means that uh, your institution needs to, to decide which application to put forth to the NEA. Um, like Courtney mentioned at the outset of this call, we're really talking about the design artworks grant program as well as the Art Town Creative Placemaking grant program today. But what we would encourage you to do is as projects or ideas come from within your institution to just reach out to us so we can assess where um, they might get the best review within our agency. And certainly if you're representing sort of design programs at the universities or colleges, um, Courtney would really be your go-to person there. But I'm also happy to connect you with colleagues in other fields. Um, and one little um, clarification or extra note to put on Jen's uh, last comment about the Artworks and or Challenge America limit, um, that is per year. So if you apply in February, then no other university or no one else from your university can apply during the year. Um, the Our Town opportunity is an exception to that. So you can apply to Our Town in addition to Artworks or Challenge America. Um, there is also an opportunity for what we call an independent component. So if your uh, university or college has a museum or a performing arts facility of some sort that's got a separate budget and a separate governance structure, um, those components can potentially be perceived as a separate organization. It's a bit in the weeds, so we won't spend a lot of time on that, but um, if you have questions about that, we're happy to answer those and help you navigate that process. Thanks, Courtney. So I think here um, we're going to dive a little more into specifics. I realize there's a lot of little bitty words on the screen right now. Um, don't expect you to take all that in, um, but we do want to talk a little bit more about the grant, um, the types of things that we fund, particularly in the Design Artworks Grant Program. We view those uh, types of projects in two sort of buckets. One is projects that have a public benefit, um, and one is projects that advance or support the design field. Uh, those categories aren't really important in terms of navigating how you apply. It's more just ways of thinking about how your work um, impacts uh, the field of design in some way. So projects that have public benefit are gonna be things like exhibitions or tours, um, public programming, community engagement processes, charrettes, um, creation of a product or a plan um, for a design project, um, something that's going to ultimately be created or built, um, even though we can't fund that part of the process. Um, or in the case of preservation, um, planning for uh, preservation of a, of a historic place, whether that's a landscape or a building um, or an artifact of some sort. Um, so those are the things that are sort of on the more public benefit side. Uh, field development side is gonna be more around conferences or symposiums or um, other kinds of events that bring designers together in some way, um, workshops or um, artist residencies or designer residencies, uh, research related to the field of design in some form. Um, uh, we often do see applications related to diversity in the field, and I know that you guys are interested in that as well, so that's also uh, relevant. Um, also, youth-oriented projects that teach young people about design in some way, whether that's through a summer camp type format or a design build effort. Um, so a lot of different ways you can, um, again, can, can come into us, a lot of different project types. Um, the things that we cannot fund specifically are just general operating support, uh, creation of new organizations, academic degrees. Now that does not exclude studio or classroom related work from happening, but just the funding of a degree we cannot pay for. Um, construction, purchasing or renovation of a facility. Um, individual artists, so it does need to be the university or college uh, or a nonprofit that's applying, not um, individual faculty members. Um, that is a little different than the way the NEH, National Endowment for the Humanities, interprets things. They focus a little more on the individual faculty members than we do. Um, ours is very organizationally driven. Um, individual schools, as in public schools, uh, are also not eligible. And then commercial or for-profit enterprises are also not eligible.
Okay. Um, so looking a little more at the actual application process, it is a multi-step process, as you might guess, because it takes 10 months to get through. Um, the first step, of course, is your application, and I'm going to dive into that um, a little more in a, in a minute. Uh, it's a two-step process, and once you've completed that, we receive your application, we sort uh, through eligibility and make sure all the applications we've received have completed all the different components of the process. Uh, we then have a panel review process, and the panelists are uh, people like you all who are working in design in some way, faculty members, um, people who have their own design practices, people working for nonprofits, um, and the same is true across different disciplines. So music is going to have music-related people, theater will have theater-related people, um, but we uh, provide those panelists with the application materials, they review them, and they score and comment those, which determines a rank which we then use to determine which projects will be recommended for funding. And I think we'll just, that's a great great thing to point out, Courtney, is that the panel process is really done by folks in the field of design. And we invite all of you, um, if you have any interest in serving as a panelist, we affectionately call it design or arts jury duty, because it really is a service to our nation in that you're lending your expertise to view and recommends the work that, that you think is worthy of the NEA um, public funding. So we certainly want to invite all of you to think about either yourself as a review panelist or colleagues of yours that you know of that would um, you know, have both the expertise to share to one of the various disciplines as well as a willingness to, to serve in that role and capacity. So just wanted to put a pin as we're, we're talking about that panel review process to make that invitation. Yes. And we in the design program particularly pride ourselves on really always encouraging new people to come in. We very yeah. rarely have people serve more than once um, because there's so much great talent in the field. And it's, um, I think it's a really um, unique opportunity for people to have insight into what's happening across the country in design. Um, so uh, once the panel review process is done, we determine recommendations, which are then sent to the National Council on the Arts. And um, the final approval is through the chairman of the agency, and then you uh, uh, recommended awards are notified um, and projects in November. So there's time to kind of uh, revise budgets and revisit projects if things have changed. Um, and then projects start, um, in the case of design, in Jan as early as January of the next year. January 2020 is the one coming up. Um, and in some cases, people do have a later start date, but that's the earliest that the funding is available. Um, and also just want to note, remind you guys, if you have questions as we're getting into some of these details, to please um, submit those. I'm happy to answer those later. And we have a few uh, things we can continue to touch on once the official presentation is over, but we do have time for questions. Um, so looking a little more closely at the actual application process, um, the first step is uh, done through grants.gov. Uh, there's a form called the SF-424, which is very federal speak. Um, it's a short form, uh, quite brief actually, um, where you basically include organizational information and the, a paragraph describing your project. Um, but in order to get to that form, um, it is a little bit of a process. Um, you have to, your organization has to be registered with SAM.gov. Um, and I'll share a little more about that in a second. Um, and you also have to have a, a DUNCE number, which I'm sure your universities do and colleges do have. Um, but those pieces of information have to be organized and together in order to complete the short form that's in grants.gov and submit that. Um, cannot hammer home enough the importance of getting ahead of the schedule on this stuff. Most of you probably be, will work, if you're going through this process, you would be working with someone from your advancement or development or grants office. Um, and so they're probably going to be familiar with this process, but it's not, none of the federal application processes are identical. So uh, we're also really happy to work with those folks if they have questions about the process um, to help them understand our, uh, our way. But any, any federal funding has to go through grants.gov. So um, that first step is, um, is having to do the grants.gov piece. The second part of that, um, it looks like my slides can misbehave here. There we go. Um, specifically to part one, the system for awards management, that SAM.gov account, um, now requires an original signed notarized letter that you have to submit to them in order for your registration to be complete. 
um, in general, that that notarized letter is not supposed to hold you up from proceeding, um, but it's all to say, if you think you're going to apply in February, get started getting that stuff done now, get done ahead of time, because there's absolutely um, no reason to miss the deadline. And if you don't complete step one, then you can't do step two. Um, step two is the primary content of your application. That's the piece of it that we've created that gives us the information we need to really review your application. Um, that's going to include um, information about your project, a paragraph describing the background of it and, and the plan for what you want to do, um, a project budget, um, again, reflecting that one-to-one -one match. So whatever amount you're asking us for, for artworks, it needs to be twice that amount or more um, in the whole budget. Um, uh, work samples, which are really important for sharing something other than words about your project, images, uh, videos, audio, anything that's relevant to help help us understand the nature of the project better. Organizational budgets um, are another piece of it, um, a schedule, how you're going to reach the audience, um, the participants in the project, people who are leading it, both from an administrative and a artistic or design point of view, um, if those are different people. Um, so all to say, it's, it's, a, it's a, a very real process. Those deadlines are not flexible. Um, but you can't get to step two if you don't do step one. Do you have anything else to add on that, Jen? No, I think that that's great. And we're going to sort of show you some resources to help orient you to the application materials and sample mm -hmm. applications. And then, again, just to put another plug and emphasis, that as you're beginning to formulate sort of your project proposal, um, to certainly reach out to the specialist uh, if you're applying to the design artworks category. Courtney is a great resource and really has lots of conversations with applicants um, to make sure that they're comfortable with pulling together their application that's, materials. That's the fun part of my job. <laughs> one of the most fun parts. Um, and then also just to um, make one other sort of note about the second start of the application, um, the way the deadlines work, it's a two-step process. So the first step, I believe, is going to be February 15th. I believe that's right. Don't don't hold me to that. But there will be details around that. Um, coming out very soon, in December is when the new guidelines come out. But you'll submit step one, and then a few days later, um, there's a week-long window that you have to submit step two. Um, and that's when you're submitting the more detailed information about your project. There's a detailed PDF on the website, and I'll talk about this in a second a little more, um, that allows you to really see those questions. But um, there's only a week-long window that you actually submit the second part. Okay, so just a few helpful hints that I'm going to dig into a little bit um, as you're applying. Um, again, just make sure you get ahead of the schedule on completing your grants.gov and sam.gov registrations. Um, take a look at our previous awarded grants, and again, I'll show you how to find that in just a second. Um, also look at sample application narratives. Each discipline has five or six narratives posted about their field that basically give you um, examples of what have been successful in the past. Definitely contact us with questions. And whether you're successful or not in an application, reach out to us for feedback. That is one of the services that we um, pride ourselves in being able to provide because we want to make sure you understand um, what worked in your project, what didn't, and all that feedback comes from the, the panelists. So just uh, briefly kind of navigating through our website. Uh, Arts.gov is the URL. Um, if you go to the drop-down menu for grants, there's an option for um, apply for a grant. And in that area, you'll be able to navigate through that to select for organizations and um, artworks, if that's the opportunity that you're looking at. And then within that page, there's a link to design. You can see a, a very fuzzy version of that page here. Um, the main reason I'm showing you guys this is just to give you a sense of, of what's on this page. So this is the main guidelines landing page talks a little bit about the opportunities, a um, little more detailed version of those lists I shared earlier of what we fund, the kinds of things we fund on that page. And then on the right side, you'll see three boxes, one with Artworks Basics, which are um, across all the, all the, um, the disciplines that show you FAQs, um, how to determine if you're eligible, things like that. And then specifics for design. Um, there's uh, three bullets there. One is how to apply or how to submit an application, and that's a, a high-level overview that looks at step one and step two. And then there's details on part one, um, which will uh, show you specifically what 
what the steps are you have to go through to register with SAM, register with Grants.gov, um, all of that, and even how to fill out the form. There's a lot of detail there that's worth you or your advancement folks looking at carefully. Um, and then the step two or the part two page um, has that sample PDF that gives you all the specific questions and includes everything from nuance of how to think about the questions to how many characters you can have in the field. So you can really prepare ahead of time for that application process. Um, the other thing to look at is recent grants. Just make sure that um, you can take a look through our website. If you click on the link on the right under Artworks Resources, that will take you to um, a map. And on that map, you can click on it, or you can just click on Recent Grant Search, and it will take you to this page where you can put in all kinds of information. Um, under Disciplines and Fields on the right, you can select um, Design. And under Categories, you can select Artworks. Um, and that'll show you all the different awards we've made to other um, design-oriented projects. Um, you can also choose Our Town. Um, and that'll show you what we've awarded in terms of our town. You can organize by date. You can search by program. Um, so it's worth kind of noodling around in there if you are just trying to get a sense of where you might fit. Yeah, and I think that this is a, a thing that I oftentimes point folks to just to really highlight the breadth of what we can fund and support. Um, sometimes I even just do like a keyword search. So if you're, you know, um, thinking about landscape architecture in a particular context, you might type in keywords landscape architecture um, and maybe the design field, or maybe you'll know uh, what state you're sort of curious to see that we've awarded design-related projects in. So all of those are really great resources to just kind of navigate and, and get a sense for the types of applications that have been successful in the past. Certainly not indicative of all that will be funded in the future, but I think it's just a, a point of inspiration as you're thinking about what a project to the NEA could potentially look like. Yes. And again, happy to also talk to you guys about specific project ideas. So going back to that guidelines page on the right side, you'll see um, a sample application narrative under the Artworks resources. That's another place to look. Um, there are sample application narratives for each of the different disciplines. Um, when you click that link, it'll take you to this page, and you can download the PDF for design. I think there's six different projects in there. Um, and we specifically picked them to be across a range of project types, so you can dig in a little deeper about what a good application looks like. And then um, just again encouraging you to contact us on that Artworks Basics page. There's a link to contact. And within that, um, in that page, um, you can scroll down by different artistic discipline under design. You'll find my email and phone number. Um, and of course, happy to share that more legibly here. Um, that is really the, 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 the main gist of what we had to share with you guys. Um, I know the question and answer box works because we've had a couple of questions, um, but we'd love to see some more. So if you guys want to submit anything you have, please do that now. Yep, and the one thing that I just think is also um, you know, worthwhile just emphasizing, so our deadline is in February 2019 for the Design Artworks grant category. It will be in August of 2019 for our town. Challenge America is April 2019. And the grant guidelines for um, the, it'll be funding for fiscal year 2020 will be released in about another month in mid-December. Um, the Design Artworks Grant Guidelines and the Challenge America Grant Guidelines have not changed very significantly, um, probably just a word or two throughout the whole thousand word <laughs> grant guidelines list. So you can certainly go based off of what's already up on the website, but you won't see those updated deadlines until mid-December. So right now you'll be seeing the when the 2018 deadlines were. So I just wanted to flag that in case you're um, really eager and, and want to get a good sense for some calendar planning um, to apply to us. No. Courtney, just one question that um, did come across is about what percentage of grants are funded by the NEA? Can you speak a little bit mm -hmm. to that to give folks a sense? Yeah, it varies a little bit from year to year, but I would say um, 50 to between 50 and 60% of our applications are funded in design most years. Um, 
and the average award in design is between thirty and forty thousand. Um, we do certainly make awards for twenty thousand or less. Um, if certainly if you ask for less, um, but and we do make a few awards that are fifty or more. Um, but thirty to forty is our average, and we try to do that in part, particularly with universities, because there are overhead costs often associated with those projects. Um, which we're conscious about. But we want to try to make sure we're giving awards that, um, even if it's less than people ask for, which does sometimes happen, um, we will get a lot of requests for 100,000, and we don't make that much, of, you know, give awards at that level very often. Um, but, I, you know, we do try to honor what people are trying to achieve with their projects and make sure that our funding can help um, move that project forward. And on that note, just a, a follow-up question to that. Um, Going back to some of the project examples that you shared, uh, I remember the one with the University of Virginia that partnered with Building Community Workshop um, and really involved the uh, design studio students. What sort of costs are, are you seeing in project proposals that come in from universities? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in that case, um, and also true for the University of Virginia one that they apply for directly, um, transportation costs are eligible, so if there's travel, particularly if students are traveling from the university to somewhere further afield, um, that's eligible. Um, uh, if students are being paid or community members are being paid um, for engagement, we really value that. We think that's important and we are glad to see it. Um, in the case of the one Jen just mentioned the, the, with Building Community Workshop, their staff time um, was included in the budget. There was cost for the engagement of the, the firm, um, and so their time was included. Um, one thing we don't generally fund is food. Um, there's a few cases where it's eligible, but generally, if you can avoid including that in our budget, that's less complicated. Um, but there's a lot of different types of costs that are eligible. Um, also, in terms of things like nonprofits applying, um, universities are tend to be a little different about this in terms of there's, they can list their staff time as eligible costs in the projects. Um, the universities do that and they often use that staff time as part of the match, um, which is allowed and, and something that they're certainly allowed to do. Um, that can include um, both staff salaries as, or faculty salaries as well as benefits. Um, other costs, like I said, travel costs, and that can be flights, that can be um, you know, train or vehicle costs, that can be hotel, um, it can be food associated with travel, so sort of per diem costs like that. Um, and then um, indirect costs are certainly eligible as well, and most universities have a, or colleges have a, um, a negotiated indirect cost rate that they've established with a federal agency of some sort, and that's um, almost getting beyond my pay grade in terms of getting into details there, but happy to help you guys uh, track those questions um, if you uh, have them. And I think just on that note, um, hopefully it was really implicit in what we shared, but just to really call it out is that we're looking to fund projects that last between 12 months and two years. So you're really putting forth a, a project budget, um, so it might require as Courtney mentioned, staff time, so a percentage of a particular faculty member who will be dedicating their time to this body of work as part of the NEA grant. So I think that's just something to really be thinking about in the context of you know, what you hope to do in the one to two year period um, mm -hmm. with NEA funds. Yep. Um, we have had uh, one question, actually this question has come up twice now, um, will these slides be available later? Absolutely. You should get a link um, following the webinar that will um, allow you to link back to this. Um, if for some reason that doesn't come through or, or there's a, a miscommunication about that, you can always go to our website um, on the main landing page, arts.gov, um, under the, the the main menu, I think it's the left-hand one, I can't remember what the heading is, but webinars are listed there and it'll be posted within the next day. And we'll just make sure also we do a PDF of all the slides so mm -hmm. that, you know, if folks don't want to listen back through the entire recording of today can really just navigate through the PDF yeah. of slides. We'll actually have um, all, of, everybody who registered for this will have your emails so we can send that out um, actively to everybody just as a reference. Um, and since we have just a couple minutes, um, I'm going to just make a couple more notes about um, things to think about as you start to think about projects. Um, as Jen mentioned, there's a lot of types of 
projects we can fund. Um, there's also, of course, all different aspects of design. So architecture planning and landscape architecture, um, urban design, but also fashion, industrial design, um, uh, design thinking, as long as it's in service of the design or arts field. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of different ways that we can work with you. Across all of that, um, one of the things to think about just in terms of how you make a case in your project, if you're applying, is making it clear who's going to benefit from the work and why federal funding, why our money should be supporting that work. So making a case for if you're working with a community, how are you reaching that community? What's your relationship with them? Um, how are they involved in the process? Um, very important to um, make sure that the voice of community members who are going to potentially participate in your project um, are heard. And in an ideal world, if there's a scenario where you're able to pay community members to participate, that's great. Um, we very much are interested in an equitable project approach and respecting the time and energy that people take uh, when they're doing community-engaged work and want to make sure that, that those people are um, honored for the time and commitment that they're making to participate in your project. Um, also, the work samples are really important. Um, those really, like I said earlier, give us a, a snapshot into the project that goes beyond the um, just the text that you're using to describe. And so if you have videos that you can share that show how your project or how past work has worked with a particular community or a particular group of people, um, if you can share, if it's a fashion project, show the work of the students who've gone through the program before or the faculty members who are teaching. We're really looking for artistic excellence and the work samples are a great way to show that, um, both in terms of the, the teaching as well as, um, in some cases, the intent of the project. If you don't have images of past work related to exactly this project, um, who are the people involved? What have they done in the past that we can have to, uh, that you can share with us to help us understand the quality of the work that's being done. That's fantastic, Courtney. And I, I think that some of you may have come by way of um, working on some type of campus preservation or historic planning effort. And we would certainly encourage you to think about how sort of that can be linked up into our project category where it's really about projects that have a public benefit. We see um, historic preservation projects being really critical to support through NEA funding. Um, particularly because that really holds some of the cultural heritage and identity that's, that's so important to not be lost in our country. Um, so certainly want to encourage you as well to be thinking about that. If you um, are one of the preservation planners um, at the a university or college, um, and I don't see any other questions coming in, so maybe we just sort of take this moment to close and just wanted to recap a few quick things. Um, we certainly, if you haven't applied to us before, if it's been a long time, we encourage you to take a look at our grant guidelines and really reach out to staff. Um, I think we're one of the most accessible federal agencies and really pride ourselves in being accessible and having great touch points with the field, so we love, 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 love to hear from you. And I also just wanted to put in a plug to let us know if you or a colleague of yours at college or university would be interested in serving as a review panelist. Um, whether they have design expertise or maybe they have theater expertise uh, might fit into one of our other programs here. We're always looking for great panelists to sign, sign up for that art, culture, design, jury duty. So we wanted to put a plug in for that as well. And lastly, we just want to thank you for taking an hour out of your time today to learn a little bit more about the National Endowment for the Arts. And we hope to be hearing from you. So uh, with that, I think we'll close out about five minutes before the end of our hour together. And just thank you for your time and hope to hear from you soon. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. Bye. Bye-bye.